Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. It's uh, my pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, introduce Vicki Caligara, who's going to be the colloquium speaker today. Many of you know she gave the Hofstetter Memorial Lecture last night. She did a spectacular job. I think uh, really brought the enthusiasm of astrophysics and gravity wave astronomy to a general public audience at a level that people could follow. Um, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing that it helps uh, outreach from the department out into the community and extends this uh, Hofstetter um, memorial lecture um, with, with a fantastic job. So. Um, Professor Caligara uh, did her undergraduate work in uh, Greece, and uh, from what I re read, she must have known where she was headed in life because uh, she did an undergraduate thesis on catac cataclysmic binaries <laughs> early on, um, and she did a PhD at uh, uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and that was x-ray binaries. And she's been binaries and binaries <laughs> following on with uh, gravity waves. She is now the, what is it, the Denny uh, Linzer Distinguished Professor in the Department of Physics and Astrophysics at Northwestern University. You may remember last year we had a, a, a Hofstetter lecturer also from Northwestern University. They seem to be a leading bright light uh, in physics. Um, she's also the founder and co-director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics and an astrophysics lead in the LIGO um, scientific collaboration. Expert in black holes and neutron stars. Um, and she has a long list of awards. I'll just list a few of those. Uh, most recently, 2018 Denny Heinemann Prize for Astrophysics of the American Institute of Physics and the American Astronomical Society, the Hans Bethe Prize of the American Physical Society, Fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, selected as one of Astronomy Magazine's top ten rising stars in astronomy. One that I really uh, appreciate is the Award for Excellence in Mentoring Undergraduate Research. Maria Gopert, Mayor Award of the American Physical Society and the Cannon Award of the American Astronomical Society. Um, today, we get to hear the more scientific details of the talk that she gave last night. Uh, the title of the talk is Dawn of Gravity Wave Astrophysics. Please join me in welcoming Vicki to the stage. Thank you, Leo. Um, oh, I'm very close to the mic. One minute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Leo, for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I've spent the last couple of days having uh, lots of interesting discussions, uh, seeing good friends from the past, and uh, lots of uh, great, great colleagues. It's been a blast. Uh, today, um, uh, it's a pleasure to tell you about uh, our results from the last couple of years on gravitational wave observations and I will focus uh, on telling you about the astrophysics. Uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, you've had um, uh, talks by great colleagues like Ray Weiss, uh, I know, maybe a year ago, uh, telling you about the uh, instrument uh, and, of course, about the discoveries. I will not tell you a lot about the instrument. You have Stanford colleagues who also work and made these amazing detectors work. Uh, and I will focus on uh, our discoveries. I always like to start my talks the past, uh, the past few months with this uh, slide that I love. Uh, we made it at Northwestern for the double neutron star discovery um, uh, press uh, announcement. And this is the Chicago uh, skyline with a neutron star hanging over the Chicago skyline to scale. Uh, and the reason I love it is not just because it shows the Chicago skyline, but because on the day of the announcement, the New York Times were forced to show the Chicago skyline on their cover story about the discovery. And I just love it that Dennis Overby 
uh, had to make that choice. Okay, let's get started. Um, so I'll tell you, uh, as I said, about the discoveries that have transformed certainly our lives in the LIGO scientific collaboration um, and uh, have, um, I think, transformed astronomy in many ways as well. So here's a quick one slide summary uh, of where we are. This is a mass scale of the compact objects we are observing, not just in gravitational waves. LIGO Virgo black holes are shown here in blue, uh, but then we also have measurements of black hole masses from uh, mainly X-ray uh, astrophysics, electromagnetic astronomy. Uh, and then, of course, we have neutron stars. We've known neutron stars' existence and mass measurements from mainly radio pulses and other electromagnetic observations. And now we have a discovery in gravitational waves of two neutron stars coming together, forming something we don't quite know what it might be. Uh, so I'll expand uh, in this, and I'm going to summarize where we are in both binary black holes and also spend a little bit of time on what we know uh, about this one binary neutron star discovery. I should say that uh, as I stand uh, here uh, as your lecturer today, I represent a, uh, a very big collaboration of colleagues, scientists and engineers from around the world. Uh, a thousand, you were, you were there last night and Stanford is not at the right place, <laughs> at the same place I could see you. Um, so, sorry, in, inside joke. Uh, um, so, <laughs> Um, so, what was I saying? Uh, yes, I represent a very large collaboration of almost a thousand scientists and engineers, and uh, and we are um, uh, uh, lots of people have worked for several decades uh, to make this uh, reality. So I. Uh, I'm only one of uh, many, many uh, faculty, uh, scientists, engineers, students, postdocs who have contributed to this. And of course, Stanford is a uh, member uh, of this collaboration. Uh, Northwestern is here, and lots of institutions across the world. And of course, MIT and LIGO, I'm sorry, MIT and Caltech. Caltech is here and MIT is somewhere here now. I can't find MIT today. Uh, yesterday I couldn't find Stanford, uh, but anyhow, MIT is somewhere there as well. Uh, and I represent the whole collaboration as, uh, as I present these results today. So as I said, this effort has been going on for several decades, uh, well before um, well, actually, right around uh, the time I was born, in the early 70s, um, uh, somewhere around there, A. Weiss was asked to uh, teach general relativity at MIT as an assistant professor, and that got him to actually study general relativity first before he had to teach it. And, um, um, and, and that got him to think about how to actually detect gravitational waves. And the rest is history. Uh, so this is the timeline. I'm not going to uh, go through it uh, in any detail. But uh, construction actually started in the mid-90s. Uh, so detection, first detection came in September 2015. And uh, the National Science Fund Foundation stuck uh, through this project uh, with this project through many many years, and it took uh, both the effort of the scientists and the, the engineers, but also uh, uh, all the funding that we needed to make this happen, and that should not be forgotten. So the flagship discoveries uh, was, of course, the binary black hole in September 2015, the binary neutron star, uh, August 2017. And uh, right around that time, October 2017, our fathers, uh, uh, Barry Berish and Kip Thorne and Ray Weiss, also were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize. And um, without them, we wouldn't be where we are uh, today. So I joined this collaboration back in 1999, and somehow this doesn't exist in the timeline. I don't know. I don't understand why. I was, um, I was a postdoc at the CFA 
Uh, I was a CFA fellow and uh, Harvard Bob uh, had, um, uh, had a, a, a gravitational way, a LIGO group for, a, for about a year with one member, me. Um, um, uh, so I joined as an astrophysicist, the first astrophysicist in the collaboration. And, and Ray would take me by the shoulders, literally, and would take me around to people and introduce me and say, hey, hey, this is Vicky, say hi to her. She's the first car carrying astronomer in the collaboration. Uh, this was not fashionable at the time, and uh, many people advised me against it. But uh, I did it part time. Uh, I was working on X ray binaries for many years. Uh, I enjoyed doing it part time, and I'm glad that I made that decision back then. Uh, over the years, I, a year later, I uh, moved to Northwestern, and over the years, uh, my contributions within the collaboration. I'll tell you about what my group did. You know, after all, I am the speaker today. Uh, so um, I started by uh, doing, uh, focusing on astrophysical predictions for LIGO. So modeling of how compact object binaries actually work, uh, what kinds of properties they might have, focusing on event rate predictions initially, but also on how we might interpret if we ever have observations. Uh, that was back in early 2000, mid 2000s. Um, but then around 2007, about 10 years ago, I decided to uh, dive into LIGO data analysis. So I became a bit of an observer before any data existed. So we did uh, in my work a lot of method development uh, for how we would analyze the data, especially not in finding the signal, but actually once we had the signal, how we would extract astrophysical information from the signal. And that was for many years something that was neglected neglected within the uh, collaboration. Everybody was afraid of missing the signal in the noise. Uh, so there were two main groups in the collaboration, Birmingham and Northwestern, that focused on how we would actually make measurements of the source properties. And uh, later I also work and still work on data and noise characterization. And I say I, but I really mean my group. Um, so I do want to focus on people. Uh, you'll see a lot of us in the collaboration. Uh, often focus on people because people get lost in these uh, hundreds and thousands of people uh, in, in the collaboration. So I do want to highlight uh, my current group members. There's two faculty in the collaboration who work on data analysis, also future generation uh, detectors. But uh, my current group members, Chris Panko, uh, two gra and then four graduate students, postdoc and four graduate students were right at the core of these two major discoveries of binary black holes and neutron stars. But I also need to thank uh, some older members um, who were postdocs and graduate students and another postdoc and they're all now faculty. Uh, across uh, England, they're moving, and, and now they're both moving to other places, Australia and back in the US, uh, England and the US and the US. And that just reminds me how old I am because when your postdocs and your student become faculty, that's the beginning of the end. Um, <laughs> when your undergraduates also become faculty, that's a scary thought. Um, that hasn't happened to me, but it's coming very close, I can tell you that. Um, all right, so I'll come back to these people because uh, uh, several of these graduate students and postdocs actually led um, uh, the papers that came out for our double neutron star discovery. All right, so let me start with the binary black holes. And let me tell you where we are now. Uh, we're at the end, we have finished our second observing run. The second observing run uh, ended on August 25th, 2017, and since then the detectors have stopped taking data. So right now we're not observing, the detectors are undergoing an upgrade and we're going to come online again sometime in the fall of 2018 with better sensitivity. And we have detected 5.85 systems in the sense that we have five secure detections and then another um, binary black hole merger where the probability that this source is actually astrophysical and not noise is about 85%. So it's a two sigma significance where everything else is five plus uh, sigma. And the mass is, what you see here is the mass measurement, so the extraction of the astrophysical 
uh, properties of the sources and we can also measure the final um, uh, black hole mass uh, forming at the end. Um, now, this, these, these detections, if you look at them at the standard uh, plot that is missing their axis here, uh, but in the standard plot of the noise curve, so this is the uh, gravitational wave strain uh, spectrum uh, in some ways, so strain density as a function of frequency. These are the classic noise curves that I'm sure many of you have seen many, many times. These are the signals we have detected, so they come with a power law in frequency and as you approach the final merger of the two black holes then you get the amplitude of the, the power in the gravitational wave signal to increase um, uh, so you get a bump and then when the two black holes merge and eventually settle into a final black hole you have a very sharp cutoff in the signal and that's the end of your transient signal. Um, now, the, the low mass black holes extend further into uh, higher frequencies and the uh, high mass black holes end at lower frequencies. The different names correspond to the dates uh, uh, on which we receive the signal and you have all six of the events right here. <coughs> um, what else? The other thing that you can see is that in this representation of the y-axis, the, the ratio between the overall height of this power law and the overall noise curve level gives you a sense, that ratio gives you a sense of the signal to noise ratio. Okay, and uh, for a um, um, for a uh, assuming a, a constant uh, rate of events within the volume around us, then you expect a uh, power law of signal to noise ratios of rho to the uh, cube um, and that's basically what we have uh, received so far within the small number sample kind of follows, it's consistent with that distribution. So nothing weird so far, we're kind of measuring a constant rate, volume, density uh, within the small volume we are uh, uh, probing at present. <clears throat> Which one was the 85%? The 85% is the LVT, so it's not a GW source, it's a LIGO-Virgo trigger, so it's the purple line and it's the one with the lowest SNR. <clears throat> I don't know where the question came, but uh, yeah, hi. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, all right, the, another way to look at the same signals is the actual H of t, the waveform, the uh, gravitational wave strain as a function of time, so this is the best fitting waveforms. And you can see uh, the duration, so the most massive signal is actually the uh, first one and it lasts the shortest and the low mass signals last longer. And then here you also uh, see the uh, double neutron star from August 17 and that one actually we're going to talk about it eventually, it lasted over 100 seconds. Okay. All right, so what do we do with these signals? So I'll try now to focus on the gravitational wave observations, of course, for the binary black holes, so that's all we have, and try and go through a, a sequence of key results and, and, and conclusions we have extracted. So I'm going to start, this being a physics colloquium, I'm going to start with testing GR. Uh, and of course, you probably all realize that there's no big news, uh, GR has passed the test, but I want to make quickly a, a few points that I think are important to keep in mind. This is the first ever time that we have been able to test general relativity in the strongest uh, field regime ever. Uh, so one measure of that is to point out and highlight for you that the binary black holes right before, uh, while they're going through the LIGO band, frequency band, and right before they merge, they reach velocities in their orbital motion that go up to 50 and 60 percent the speed of light. So we have never had anything observed in nature that moves that fast. 
uh, a, a macroscopic object. Okay? So this is testing general relativity and gravity at these extremely high velocities. And we have published testing GR results for the first uh, binary black hole detection and the second secure binary black hole detection. Uh, and this shows you if you can define a velocity, uh, then it shows you that it follows, uh, you know, it goes up to about 60%. And the second one is a lower uh, mass si signal. It also goes up to about 60% velocity. In comparison, up until these discoveries, the best GR tests were coming from the uh, double pulsar system that was discovered back in 2003. Uh, so two neutron stars, both of them detected as radio pulsars. And in the double pulsar system, the relative velocity of the two neutron stars in their orbit is only 0.1% of the speed of light. Okay? <clears throat> All right, now I have a few slides here uh, about all the different tests that we did, non-parametric tests of GR, and I, I will actually not go in detail through them because I am afraid that I will never get to the end of my lecture, but I will tell you that we didn't, what we did is, as a collaboration, we decided that we will not take alternative theories of gravity and test one by one or set constraints on different parameters. Instead, we decided to set upper limits or do consistency tests um, uh, on GR itself and any deviations away from GR uh, with our data. So we did a number of different tests looking at this question from a few different angles. And I can tell you that every time we looked at it, we basically set upper limits to uh, deviations from GR and we have no reason to uh, claim any deviation away from GR. If you'd like to know more about the specifics of how we did this, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I will point out one thing. If we look at, um, uh, um, if we cast uh, our gravitational wave phase in a post-Newtonian expansion and we look at coefficients, um, um, within the GR framework and then we ask, okay, how much deviation from the GR framework are we um, uh, allowed to have based on our data? We are setting for the first time, we can set upper limits for these deviations to high orders, PN orders, that we have never had the opportunity to set before with the binary uh, uh, pulsars uh, ever before, okay? So we can go all the way up to 3.5 pn order and uh, only down to 0 pn the double pulsar is beating us on the upper limit and the reason is that the double pulsar is not more relativistic but it is being observed for many many more years while we only have 0.2 seconds for our first uh, uh, detection. We only have 0.2 seconds of data uh, and we cannot quite beat um, uh, deviations at 0 pn order. Okay? All right, so when we got the second binary black hole, our upper limits improved a little bit, but basically the story remains the same. So now I'm going to move on to astrophysics. Um, uh, so, the main things we try to measure with our gravitational wave data are basically masses, spins of black holes, and we can also measure distance, which from the astronomy perspective is spectacularly important. Uh, and uh, the beauty of gravitational wave signals is that we measure amplitude directly, and knowing the amplitude and assuming GR is correct allows you to also measure the distance. So a, a few simple formulae in the uh, quadruple approximation with a few sim simple approximations as well that I'll try to highlight uh, gives these simple formulae that uh, I'll try to sort of um, uh, point out a few simple things for you to get a feeling uh, of where the, the, the key measurements are coming from, okay? So you probably have heard that really what we measure when it comes to mass is the, what we call the chirp mass. It's this combination of the two masses of the black holes or any, the two compact objects that are merging. 
and they're basically the chirp mass is connected to the frequency of the signal and the frequency derivative of the signal and uh, fundamental constants. So we get the H, the gravitational wave strain, as a function of time. We can measure the frequency and the frequency derivative, and we can extract the chirp mass. Um, then we can also, because we measure the amplitude of the gravitational wave strain as a function of time, and we have the chirp mass from these two observables, we can then also extract the distance. Now there's a few other factors here that depend on our line of sight with respect to the orbital plane of the binary, okay, that I'm skipping here. But fundamentally there's actually a degeneracy between the distance and the orientation of the binary plane with respect to us. So there is a distance inclination degeneracy and that's where some of the uncertainty in the distance comes. Could I ask somebody to move there? Thank you. Um, I don't know why I included this third formula, it just says the same thing as that one. Um, okay, then spin effects come in the uh, phase uh, and amplitude evolution at higher order terms. So they don't appear in this simple formula up there, uh, but if you go to higher expansion, PN expansion, uh, terms, then you get the spin effects to, or, to enter. And then spin effects get coupled to the mass dependencies, okay? But uh, knowing GR and assuming it's correct, you can then start looking at these additional higher order terms and make measurements of the spin effects. And the spin effects uh, make themselves um, uh, visible uh, in the gravitational wave amplitude and phase modulations and at the end just like we don't measure directly masses uh, we don't measure directly the individual spins of the two black holes but we measure uh, through the the way we cast the, our waveforms we measure two spin parameters the chi effective and the chi p we measure or constrain one can debate which is the right word um, uh, but we can constrain or measure these two spin-related parameters that are uh, uh, described here. And let me now tell you in words what these are. Basically, chi effective is the combined uh, spin of the two black holes that is aligned with the orbital angular momentum axis and it's mass weighted. Okay, and then the chi perpendicular chi p is the other component that's in the plane of the binary. Okay, this is the picture to have in mind. So we can't measure the individual spins, that would be perfect, but just like we can't measure individual masses, uh, we measure this mass weighted combination uh, of the aligned spin components and the uh, potentially, and if we're lucky, to be honest, we may have a chance of measuring chi p, all right? So this is what we can get out of our system. So let's start with the masses. We have our sixes uh, uh, detections, and this is what we have measured so far. So in the primary mass and secondary mass plane, we get these bananas, or for each source and basically the lines along these bananas is a line of constant chirp mass. Okay? And then you project it onto the plane and you get much bigger uncertainties on the individual masses. Um, so we can tell that now we are sampling quite a wide range of black hole masses. So the LIGO black holes, they're not all heavy. They're not all 30 solar masses. We're getting the 10 solar mass black holes that we knew from X-ray astrophysics all the way out now to the 30 solar mass, which is what we started with in September 2015. Uh, and these had been predicted, by the way, just to make the point that uh, 30 solar mass black holes were not a shocking surprise when they came uh, in September 2015. So astrophysicists like me 
um, not me, like me, <laughs> uh, had written papers expecting 30 solar mass black holes in the universe from stars. Okay? But of course, to, see, to, to actually observe them as the first merger was quite, um, uh, quite stunning. So these are the mass measurements we have now. And then here's what we have with <coughs> spins. And the spin story is more complicated and hard to interpret right now with our small sample. Um, so this is how we represent our spin results. And uh, the, um, the way we represent our results, which is all summarized on this slide, is what not to do with visuals when you want to communicate with your results. <laughs> Uh, but this is what we've done, and the reason is that we've presented these results in a sequence of papers over two years. And the way we write our papers is by assigning a writing team or five to ten people. Uh, the people usually who have uh, contributed most to that particular analysis. And we haven't gotten our act together to have the same color scale, the same dynamic range, uh, so that when you put these spin disks, as we call them all together, they all mean the same thing. No, they don't all mean the same thing. So I'll try now to use these spin disks and guide you and tell you what we're really measuring. All right, so first let me explain what they are. Let's look at, uh, oh, whatever, let's pick this one. Is this the LVT? No, this is the second firm discovery. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, so, uh, left hand side and second and right hand side of the disk is the primary black hole and the secondary black hole, lo uh, higher mass and lower mass. Uh, and you can tell from a quick look on the second disk, the right hand side half disk, that basically we don't measure anything much. Now, you can't always tell that, you may think we're measuring something significant here, but it's all a visual bad impression. I can tell you by looking quantitatively correctly at the data that we have very loose constraints on the secondary spin properties. Um, now, on the primary spin properties, what we're showing here is the spin magnitude that goes from zero to maximal one for the black hole, and then we're measuring the tilt with respect to the orbital angular momentum axis. Okay, so the tilt could be zero or it could be anti-aligned to 180. And, uh, and of course, the magnitude is the radius of the disk. Um, so, so we get these two-dimensional uh, 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 distribution functions. And by the way, when, uh, when I was telling you earlier that um, uh, you know, I, I focused on parameter estimation and extracting astrophysical properties. This is uh, my group focused on how we're going to measure the spin out of this. So this is really close to my heart. And um, the spin disk idea is, was Ben Farr's, uh, my graduate student's, uh, idea, except he couldn't enforce a single color scale for our, all our papers. Um, okay, so what do we know and what we don't know about the spins of these black holes? Um, there is clearly some black holes that for, we can tell that this black hole, for example, is not anti-aligned. Okay, that's pretty clear. Um, or that this black hole is clearly anti-aligned here, uh, unless, and that's where the caveats come, unless the spin magnitude is tiny, okay? So the punchline out of here is that right now we think we can constrain, we're not measuring really spin properties yet. And by the way, where is Daniel Halls? There he is. So he may disagree at some point with me. He's one of your visitors here from the University of Chicago. So he works on spins as well. Um, but uh, so feel free to yell at me, Daniel. <laughs> uh, but I would say that uh, we're not measuring spin properties yet. 
uh, we are constraining spin properties and the problem we have is that if the spin magnitudes of these black holes are small then we can't say anything and the truth is we haven't excluded small spin magnitudes for any of these black holes except maybe for this one okay and for this one we have excluded small spin magnitude but we haven't excluded zero tilt and why am I making such a big fuss about this because the tilt and the magnitude are gonna connect to how these binary black holes form are you yelling at me or am I right <laughs> all right so that's where we are. The rest, the colors and how dark they are, etc. the scales are not the same and it's maddening to me that we can't get our act together, but hopefully we will eventually. Yes? No, I'll ask another question later, but from the final, after the merger, the ring down and the damping, I don't know how well that's constrained. The final spin? The final spin state of the... Uh, yes, so we, we do actually, I have a plot of that for different reasons, but here's a plot of the final spin, final mass and final spin for the first binary black hole. This is the real uh, constraint we have, but it's not that the black line is our final statement, but it is not a direct measurement from the data. So we fit the waveform through most of the signal before that final post-merger bit of the data. And then the waveform tells us, because of, uh, uh, of, our, of our GR understanding, what is that final spin and final mass. If you just use the data, then you get that constraint that says post in spiral okay and that's much looser and then the final spin constraint from the data directly is anywhere between 0.1 and 1 okay all right anything else yeah Uh, this is the September 2015. And what's the question? Why, why does that not have the best constraints on spin? Ah, because to measure whether we can measure spin well or not, it depends on also the orientation of the binary on the signal to noise ratio. Now that was a loud event, but it depends on our orientation with respect to the uh, binary and how strong the spin effects were. Uh, it depends on the spin magnitude of the black holes, so all of that combination may or may not allow us to have a strong constraint on the spin. So in that particular case, we don't have as good constraints as in the other case. Okay? All right. Okay. Um, let me um, um, move on. So another thing we measure, so mass, spins, and distance, but of course once you sample events, you can also measure the rate of these events. So since I spent a few years of my life to say it's an understatement, um, uh, figuring out rates for these detectors before there were any um, uh, uh, observations. Let me tell you where we are when it comes to rates because they constrain uh, models. So we have these six years or so detections. We can extract binary black hole rate distributions with some uncertainty and the uncertainty is here and you see it covers orders of magnitude still. Uh, yet it's the first time we can measure a rate with actual data for binary black hole mergers. So by itself is already something. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but I do want to highlight the following. There is the statistical uh, uncertainty of extracting the rate because we only have six events. In fact, this one is at the end of 01, so at the time these results are 2.85 events. Um, 
but there is a systematic uncertainty uh, in extracting the rate that has to do with what do you assume is the underlying mass distribution of these events in the universe. And if you assume that it is flat in log or it's some power law of a given value, then you get this value, then you get different rates, uh, rate, rate ranges. And if you get the unified interval, then this is our rate constraint, okay, in these particular units. And as you can tell, it's not rate, it's rate per unit volume that we quote. <clears throat> okay, so uh, by using the masses, we can also constrain the mass distribution. And if you assume it's a power law, then you can constrain it, this uh, little a here, alpha, is constrained to be somewhere in this range right now. And it's going to get better and better. We're about, we're writing a population uh, paper that should come out sometime in the next few months and we're going to have better constraints on that. Uh, so, uh, this is where we are with the story of rates. This is our best constraint right now that we have published at least. And these are different predictions from different formation scenario. We had a review back in 2010 that I worked with my postdoc, uh, Ilya Mandel. He was the lead and I was the second lead. Uh, and this was, uh, it was a review. Uh, so back then in 2010, the literature, uh, including some of our own work, placed the binary black hole rate throughout this huge range. And we had said the best guess, educated guess, was there. The rate right now is up there. Okay, so the fact that we got the binary black holes the way we got them does indeed, it's pointing to high rates, okay? Um, even though we still have an uncertainty of, or, of about an order of magnitude. All right, so now a little bit more about the astrophysics of binary black holes. How do we want to use the six systems, but really how do we want to use the systems we're going to be discovering in the next few years? We want, from an astrophysics point of view, we want to understand how these binary black holes form in the universe. We don't really understand what's going on. We have lots of theories. There are two main channels, and I will not go into the dirty, uh, uh, difficult astrophysics. Um, for this audience, but I'll give you the big picture. The big picture says uh, we can form binary black holes in the universe through isolated binaries. So you start with two stars, they go through their stellar evolution, somehow they stay together in their binary, and eventually you get two black holes in that binary and they merge. The other story says you live in a dense stellar environment, the star with globular clusters, young clusters, galactic centers, maybe it's primordial black holes in the early universe, but you get individual black holes to form, but they are in a dense environment, they go through gravitational uh, scattering and they form uh, binaries after the individual black holes have formed. Okay? Uh, each channel has sub-channels or sub-theories, etc. And I won't go into those details. So the question is, oh, and then I have little graphics about the different channels. I will skip these details. This is an actual gravitational, uh, this is not a movie artist impression. This is an actual gravitational scattering simulation. Uh, except the black holes have their gravitational lensing event shown, I'm sorry, effects shown in the movie uh, that you're watching there. So this is what happens to individual black holes and they end up forming pairs. All right, so how can we distinguish among paths? We'd like to be able to distinguish if we can. If there is a dominant path, we'd like to know which it is. Of course, nature may not have a dominant path. Maybe both uh, are in operation. Um, maybe we can measure branching ratios. Um, that, for that, we we'll probably need lots of binary black holes, bigger samples, etc. But how, what can we use to distinguish these channels? There's a lot of, I could spend a whole hour after this slide, discussing 
all the theoretical predictions about these properties and how we can use them, how big samples we would use for each characteristic, when will we get to a conclusion, etc. I'm not going to do this today. That's for an astrophysics colloquium, not for a physics colloquium. And, um, and the answer is not known today. With six events, the punchline is we can't really tell right now. Uh, also, I'm, I'm putting this list here, and there are no references, but there's tons of work being done, both in the past, but especially the last two years, there's basically a paper every week out discussing how we're going to do this. You know, my group has tons of papers, Daniel's group has tons of papers, and another 10 groups around the world uh, has tons of papers, but there's no references up there because there's no point. Uh, but we can use merger rates or the chirp mass measurements or the spin orientations. I'll make a quick point here uh, about spin orientations um, that basically the isolated binary evolution, more or less, you can push the models as much as you want, Daniel, but <laughs> more or less the isolated binaries are going to give you small tilts uh, uh, within 30 to 40 degrees for the spins with respect to the orbital angular momentum axis. Ooh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. But the dynamical formation channel, where the black holes are coming together through dynamical interactions, there's no reason for the spins to be correlated with the orbital angular momentum axis. So the, spin, the tilts should be isotropic. So that spin tilt measurement, if we can get at it from the gravitational wave data, is kind of important. If the spin magnitudes are tiny though, we'll never get to the spin tilt measurement. Okay? So that's why we're agonizing about the spin disks. Um, mass ratios, different predictions for different models. If we get out to see black holes out to a redshift of one or two, which we can do by the time we are at design sensitivity, different models, different predictions, and then the different models have different predictions for orbital eccentricity, which in the LIGO band is the same for the two channels, but when we get to have LISA, the orbital eccentricity can be seen in binary black holes in the LISA band. Now you may think, oh, but come on, LISA is not until 2035. But wait, we've been, I've been in this game for almost 20 years. LISA is in 2035, that's only 15 years later. You know, I can wait. I think I can wait. So, um, so, you know, we can wait for Lisa to answer this question. All right, so that's the story with binary black holes. How am I doing with time? All right, so time to talk about the one now, double neutron star source. So, on August 17th, uh, we woke up and we found in our data, uh, a signal that was not just a fraction of a second, it wasn't a couple of seconds, but it was almost 140 seconds. And we knew immediately that was two neutron stars. Okay? We didn't need to know anything else or look at some complicated analysis or pipeline. So we received um, in the two LIGO detectors in this kind of plot that I haven't, I guess I didn't show this before for the binary black holes, but if you look at frequency as a function of time, uh, we saw this extremely long banana that we had never seen before. Uh, less visible in Hanford, but clearly there's a signature of a banana here. There wasn't anything in Virgo, even though Virgo, the detector in Italy, was operating. Uh, that, at the end, the lack of signal in Virgo helped us localize uh, the source good, well on the sky. Independently, uh, and before we figured out there was something in our detectors, we had received word from the Fermi satellite uh, that there was a gamma ray signal 
uh, in the uh, GBM instrument from Fermi. And, um, and, and we put the two together and honestly, uh, you know, there was, there was clear, I mean, the fact that there was a gamma ray signal within two seconds uh, of our gravitational wave signal and we had 140 seconds in our data, uh, you know, we didn't need much confirmation after that. Uh, so we knew we were dealing with a double neutron star uh, and we had an electromagnetic detection at the same time. So we, that was another um, earth shattering day for us. <clears throat> okay, great localization, thanks to Virgo not detecting anything. Uh, and uh, as, as soon as night uh, fell uh, in the south, uh, a team uh, led by Ryan Foley, in, uh, who's now in Santa Cruz, uh, made the first discovery of the optical counterpart of the source uh, with a swap telescope and within literally I think 10, 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and 30 minutes other groups uh, started reporting as well following uh, Ryan's report that they could see the same optical source uh, which was the counterpart to the gravitational wave uh, signal and the gamma ray signal. And over the days and the weeks uh, that followed, there were counterparts found in, across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Um, okay, you saw these kids. I'm gonna do this uh, rather quickly. I'm very proud that at Northwestern, we didn't just um, uh, uh, lead uh, in papers, and I'll, I'll make a quick comment with my team, these four graduate students and one lonely postdoc uh, in gravitational wave discovery, but also we had just hired two young faculty in electromagnetic observations, first year faculty and not even yet a faculty, but with a uh, faculty position starting for her uh, in September and they led um, publications in the uh, electromagnetic properties of the counterpart as well. I do want to mention something and, and you know I do it because I'm so proud for all their work. On the day of the discovery the LIGO collaboration announced, published six papers. Okay, I told you that the way we publish papers is we pick writing teams and the writing teams have five to ten people. Uh, to be on the writing team is a big honor. To be chairing the writing team is fantastic. We, the five people you saw at Northwestern were on the writing teams for four of the six papers the collaboration put out on that announcement. My postdoc and one of my graduate students chaired uh, two of these six papers for the writing team. And then I was a member and another faculty was a member and another postdoc was a member. So this discovery for us was, was you know, everything we worked for came together in the two months after that discovery. We were preparing for this work for, for many, many years. Um, one of the spectacular papers that came out, I'm going to skip this, skip this. Uh, okay, one of the spectacular, I, don't, I know I have a slide somewhere, but I'll say it now. One of the spectacular papers that came out was this multi-messenger astronomy paper that had 4,000 authors. Um, uh, I was on the writing team of that. I consider that to be the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life and I will never, never do that again. Uh, uh, um, the, the paper almost killed the writing team, um, but it was worth it uh, because I think it's a historic paper and it's worth having written it. Uh, and, and I think none of us will ever forget the experience of telling the story of how this discovery actually happened. All right, what did we measure? And where are the caveats and what's going on with this double neutron star? Well, first we measured masses. We measured all of these things. I won't go through the table. But first we measured masses <coughs> for the neutron stars. And we have a caveat in our mass measurements. 
our masses are different or the mass constraints are different depending on what we assume about the spins of the neutron stars. This is not the case for the binary black holes uh, because uh, for, for reasons I won't go into right now, it doesn't make a big difference for the binary black holes. For the neutron stars it does. If we assume if we basically don't constrain the spins for the neutron stars, we get the mass constraints we see, you see in red. So let's say the primary mass is anywhere between 1.34-ish all the way to a long tail to 2.7 solar masses. However, the neutron stars we see in our galaxy, uh, in binary neutron star systems, have, we know their spins. That's how we measure them in radio waves. Those spins are very small in these units. So if we constrain them in this one source to be as small as the spins in the galactic binary neutron stars, then the mass constraints become much tighter. Okay? So, uh, so the, our mass constraints from this one source have this caveat or this uncertainty that you see here. No matter what, we're below um, three solar masses. Now, if you go with what we know about our galaxy, we kind of consider the blue post posterior distributions to be the mass measurement. Okay? Now, if you go with the more agnostic, oh, we don't know what the spins are, then you might claim, oh my goodness, we measured two and a half solar mass neutron stars. But none of us really believes that. But that's out there for us to consider. We'll see what happens with more sources. Okay, now we were also able <coughs> to constrain um, uh, equation of state uh, for the neutron stars. We can only set an upper limit on this lambda parameter. It's always with gravitational waves, you never measure the one thing you really want to know, the radius of the neutron star, no. We can only set a constraint on this parameter lambda, which depends on the radius over the mass uh, to the fifth power. Um, and really what we measure is, uh, this, the, the, we can also measure this combined quantity that involves both neutron stars. But for the two different spin assumptions, the no real constraint on the spin or the more realistic spin constraint here, we set a 90% upper limit in this lambda 1, lambda 2 space for the two neutron stars that sits here, the values don't matter for you right now. The point is that they exclude these two equations of state that are known as MS1 and MSB, MS1 and MS1B. And again, I won't go into the details, but I'll translate now this into a constraint on the radius. Okay, this is an upper limit. We cannot exclude lambda zero. Lambda zero means radius zero. Okay, we cannot exclude that right now. Uh, this 90% upper limit only excludes these extreme equations of state. So now if we go into the more familiar nuclear physics mass radius plot, that's where, Roger, it was 14 kilometers. <laughs> um, this is what we can exclude, the MS1 and MS1B right now, at 90 percentile. <coughs> um, now, we're doing more work on the data and we're going to have an update. This was the most conservative result in October 2017. We can extract better constraints from the data and there's going to be an update on this upper limit here. This is what people have claimed, the uh, Cyan region have claimed based on X-ray uh, constraints, okay? So hopefully we're gonna tighten up that upper limit. But right now we're not yet quite learning new information uh, about equation of state constraints. Running out of time rapidly. Okay, let me get here. Rates about double neutron stars, one system. But one system means the rate is not zero, okay? 
but um, here's the thing. Uh, we had tons of predictions, and back when I was naive and an assistant professor, I was dealing with rate predictions from double neutron stars, and Ramesh Narayan, Bob, was responsible for that. He asked me to work on that, because he had a report to write, and he didn't know how to do the calculation. And he said, Vicky, you do the calculation. <laughs> so, um, so, so back in 2004, I worked on the two double neutron stars we knew back then. And, and quantified all the uncertainties and, and uh, uh, came up with a very careful quantitative method for making rate predictions that gave me two orders <laughs> of magnitude uncertainty in the rate predictions plus systematics. But I quantified everything very carefully. Then in 2010 with Ilya, we looked, we knew a lot more about binary pulsars at the time. Uh, many more had been discovered. Um, and, and we said, okay, uh, we can now with some confidence uh, decide that there is a, what we consider to be a realistic value for the double neutron star merger rate. And in 2010, we published this review that I referred to before. And we gave the literature numbers of where the binary neutron star rate is going to be and we said this value is the most likely value. Now this is ridiculous that the peak of our current distribution is just off that value uh, but, uh, but I like to point it out for now. Uh, <laughs> Now, I know, and I'm going to say it here so that I don't appear completely silly, I actually know that I, I think the true value is probably going to um, shift to the left, but we'll see, <clears throat> um, based on more statistics, but we'll see where it goes. An important thing to point out is that a lot of our theoretical models, um, uh, these are not my papers, but I was involved well before 2015, and my predictions were in the same regime. So the theoretical modeling of, of uh, binary neutron star formation totally underpredicts the rates. So the theorists have, were not able to form binary neutron stars at the rates we're observing right now. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay, this is the paper uh, uh, that killed us, and I'll skip it. And then I had a few slides to tell you a little bit more about what we learned about the kilonova and the optical observations. But given that I am horribly out of time, and given that those are not gravitational wave observations and certainly have nothing to do with my group or the LIGO collaboration, I will skip those slides. Um, I'm happy to take questions about that. Obviously, we learned a lot from the optical and gamma ray observations, uh, but there are other experts um, connected to that. I will highlight to say that from the combination of electromagnetic and um, uh, gravitational wave observations, we have now a new way of measuring the Hubble constant. I have nothing to do with that measurement or that analysis, but you have a great visitor in your audience and at your institution, and you should ask Daniel to give a talk about that. Uh, my group did work on the progenitor and some of the kilonova predictions, and I have no time to tell you anything about this. <laughs> I promise yesterday I was really on time, but I will finish by telling you what to expect next, and that's the last slide. In the fall, we're going to turn on, and we think we're going to uh, uh, be able to see double neutron stars on average out to 120 megaparsecs. Uh, when we turned off, uh, we could see them on average out to 80 megaparsecs. Okay? Uh, if we reach 120 megaparsecs, this is what we expect uh, for, based on the current rate measurements and how far or how much volume we're going to cover. This is what we expect. These are the details with all the error bars, etc. But rule of thumb, we of course expect lots of binary black holes 
it may be that we may have a few per week, up to a few per week, but at least a few per month. We're going to run for a year. Double neutron stars, at least one per month, maybe a few per year, pessimistic, but it might be as often as one per month. Okay. Um, now, we have some dependencies in these predictions. Uh, we don't know exactly the mass distribution for the binary black holes, that's why this uncertainty. And in terms of neutron star black holes, we may get zero. There's 50% probability right now in our predictions that we may get zero or 50% that we may be above zero. The quantitative results are all shown in these curves here as a function of number and they tail off at dozens or maybe a hundred for the binary black holes in one year of a run. So, next year, I don't think we'll, any of us will get any sleep. Um, and if we don't find a way to write our papers faster than we normally do as a collaboration, I don't know when we'll be able to tell you the rest uh, about what we're seeing in the data. But somehow we're going to make it happen. Thank you. Time for a few questions. There's one. In your estimation of the rate of neutron star neutron star merger, did uh, the frequency of short gamma ray bursts play any role in that? Or did you can you repeat the question? Yes, I can repeat the question. The question is in the estimation, in the gravitational wave estimation, or the prediction before any gravitational wave observations? Okay. Okay, so in the gravitational wave statement of the rate for binary neutron star, uh, oops, sorry, for binary neutron star uh, 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 merger rates, uh, we don't use anything about short gamma ray bursts, no beaming, no nothing. We just know how much volume we have covered in our sensitivity of the gravitational wave detectors, how much time. Uh, we've been observing. We assume two different mass distribution for the neutron stars, but really it doesn't make a big difference. And then we know our background and we can estimate how much, uh, and we have one detection and we can do all the statistics and we get this kind of probability distribution function for the rate per unit volume. So no assumptions about gamma ray bursts or binary pulsars or anything. The, um, uh, this range here, and actually this whole range here, was back in 2010 based on the binary pulsars alone. So no theory and no short gamma ray burst assumptions. Uh, just the binary pulsars and the uncertainties were coming from the luminosity function of the pulsars. Uh, and that's where the systematic uncertainties and the beaming of pulsars. <coughs> Other question? <coughs> Yes, yeah, so the spin, uh, the spin magnitude, right? Yes, so there are spin magnitude measurements based on X-rays, uh, X-ray astrophysics, uh, combined with some analysis of optical emission and uh, UV and infrared emission of the accretion disks <coughs> around black holes. Um, and uh, I don't have a plot, but I, there's a collection of the spin magnitudes, and they basically uh, uh, cover the full range from about 0.1 maximal spin all the way to maximal spin. Uh, and and um, and for some of them, and it covers both high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. Uh, lots of accretion and little accretion, so it's not even clear whether those spins are birth spins from the black holes or they are accretion-induced uh, spins. So it could be anything, as far as we, yeah. <coughs> One more question. I was just going to ask about the Kagra. There's a chance that Kagra might join by the end of 03, yeah? yeah um, 
Yeah, I think they're trying. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the question was about Kagra. There is another uh, detector coming online in Japan. Um, and, uh, and there is a chance that maybe they will join by the end of 03. So if we start by the end of 2018, then they would have to join by the end of 2019. And yes, they are trying, uh, and we hope they will be able to join, but we'll see if it happens. Yeah. Peter? So, so you, the next run will, you indicated, would last a year? Yes, that's the plan. If we reach so the what sensitivity. After a year? After a year, we, we're still not in, in design sensitivity. Uh, so we're going to go down and uh, the instrumentation folks are going to uh, start to uh, upgrade the instrument again. So design sensitivity is supposed to reach two, for LIGO. 200 megaparsecs where we can see neutron stars. So if we reach, here is the third observing run, first, second, third. If we reach 120, we're going to run for a year, but eventually we want to go to 200. So there's still work on the instrument. Where does Lisa show up on this Oh, Lisa, um, Lisa is, is 2034 officially, launch date, so it's off a scale, but uh, also it, it doesn't cover the frequency band that the ground-based detectors cover. So that's why we need it. It's now multi-wavelength gravitational wave astronomy. So Lisa is, uh, so the, the frequency band for ground-based detectors is from about, let's say, roughly 10, 20 hertz to at best a thousand hertz. We're not there at a thousand, but that's the target. Um, Lisa is from a millihertz at best to 0.1 hertz at best. So it's like going from an X-ray detector to a radio detector or something like that. Okay. So given the time, I think we're going to have to stop with questions, but let's thank Vicky again. For that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I took a